This screencast discusses selected topics on the axial skeleton. You may find information on the axial skeleton in Chapter 6 of your textbook. This screencast was designed to help you achieve the following objectives. Describe the structure and function of the paranasal sinuses. Describe the structure and function of the fontanelles. And for the vertebral column, describe the structure, list the functions, and explain primary and secondary curvatures. You learned the anatomy of the axial skeleton in lab, and we are not going to rehash that information. However, there are a few topics that I do believe are important that I would like to discuss. Just a reminder, the axial skeleton includes the bones of the long axis of the body. They are shown in green in this figure from your book, and they include the bones of the skull, the bones of the vertebral column, as well as the bony thorax, which includes the breastbone or sternum, the ribs, as well as the thoracic vertebrae that articulate with the ribs. The first topic I'd like to discuss are the paranasal sinuses. Several bones of the skull contain cavities or air spaces. Para means besides, so these air spaces are located beside the nasal cavity. In fact, these spaces are connected to the nasal cavity through tiny holes called foramina. The paranasal sinuses are lined with mucosa or mucous membrane. Functions of the paranasal sinuses include lightening the skull, as well as acting as resonance or echo chambers for speech. You probably have realized that when you have congestion of your nasal cavity and the paranasal sinuses that your voice doesn't project as it normally does. It has a stifled or sometimes what's described as a nasally sound. Air entering the nasal cavity also enters the paranasal cavities. And sometimes that air brings in allergens or bacteria or viruses, resulting in a large production of mucus. This can lead to clogging of the paranasal sinuses. This prevents equalizing pressure between the air outside the body and that which is inside the paranasal sinuses, and this results in sinus pressure and uh, sinus pain. It can be very, very uncomfortable. When you have inflammation of the sinuses uh, due to an allergen or bacteria or virus, this is referred to as sinusitis. I would now like to talk about a particular feature of the infant's skull. At birth, the cranial bones of the infant skull are not completely fused. There are spaces between them, and these spaces are covered with a fibrous membrane connecting one cranial bone to another, and these are called fontanelles. Fontanelle comes from, or means rather, fountain, and that reflects the fact that if you look closely at the fontanelle, you can actually see blood pulsing through the blood vessels, and it looks somewhat like a fountain. The purpose of the fontanelle is to allow compression and molding of the skull during the birthing process, which facilitates passage through the birth canal. Also, the brain of the infant is growing very quickly, and the fontanelle allow expansion of the cranial cavity to facilitate brain growth. The fontanelle slowly calcifies such that at 24 months of age, 24 months after birth, the fontanelle are completely calcified. After that, there is still expansion of the cranial cavity as the cranial bones can continue to grow, and so there is some growth of the brain subsequent to calcification of the fontanelle. Fontanelles are also commonly referred to as soft spots. I would now like to discuss another component of the axial skeleton, the vertebral column. 
The vertebral column consists of a stack of circular bones called vertebrae. At the center of each vertebrae is an opening called the vertebral foramen. The vertebral foramen of all of the vertebrae form the spinal canal through which the spinal cord extends. There are 33 vertebrae in a fetus and young child. As the child ages, some of the vertebrae fuse to leave 26 vertebrae. The individual vertebrae are separated by intervertebral discs. Intervertebral discs are composed of fibral cartilage and they act like shock absorbers and they also allow some movement between the junction of adjacent vertebrae. The vertebrae themselves are held together by ligaments. The overall curvature of the vertebral column is sigmoid or S-shaped. This allows the vertebral column to act like a spring absorbing mechanical energy that might otherwise cause trauma to the brain through normal movements such as running, jumping, etc. In addition to protecting the spinal cord, the vertebral column also supports the weight of the head, the chest, the upper appendages, as well as the abdomen. And the vertebral column acts as an axis for movement. The vertebral column is subdivided into five regions with alternating curvatures, at least in an adult or a child that has learned to walk. Let me explain what I mean by curvatures. For our discussion, the curvatures will always refer to the posterior aspect of the body. The cervical region of the vertebral column includes the vertebrae of the neck and the curvature is concave. The thoracic region of the vertebral column includes those vertebrae that articulate with the ribs and the curvature there is convex. The lumbar vertebrae of the lower back have a curvature that is concave to the posterior aspect. And lastly, the sacral vertebrae, which are fused, provide a convex curvature. So you have alternating curvatures as you move from one region of the vertebral column to an adjacent region. At least this is the case in an adult or a child that is able to walk. Infants are born with a C-shaped spine. In other words, all of the curvatures are convex. However, once the infant learns how to hold his or her head up, the cervical curvature becomes concave. And once the toddler learns to walk, the lumbar curvature becomes concave as well. Because these curvatures develop after birth, they are referred to as secondary curvatures. The thoracic and sacral curvatures are known as primary curvatures because one is born with those convex curvatures and they are maintained throughout life. The next screencast will discuss selected topics on the appendicular skeleton.